The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. Every American knows something of the life and works of Thomas Alva Edison. He is properly called the complete genius. Before the dawn of the present century, he had established himself as an outstanding inventor of all time. To Mr. Edison, one invention was a challenge which led to others. As an example, take the incandescent lamp or electric bulb. After he had developed it, he went ahead with other developments, the dynamo, the method of wiring, the electric meter, and the junction box that made the whole system function as a commercial actuality. He invented the stock exchange ticker. Then he perfected a telegraph relay, which would accept 3,000 words per minute, a speed so fast that he had to develop both a paper and an ink, which would operate at that rate. He was constantly at work, seeking to develop new ideas and improve upon old ones. He was inspired by the same creative urge that inspires research chemists, men who are striving to fulfill the DuPont edge, better things for better living through chemistry. As an overture, Don Voorhees and the DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra bring you a special musical setting of Irving Berlin's popular Crinoline Days from the Music Box Review. DuPont Cavalcade moves forward. This evening, the DuPont Cavalcade does not seek to retell the facts you already know about Edison, the inventor, but rather to relate several little-known episodes in the life of Edison, the man. The material used is mostly new and unrecorded. Much of it has been gathered by personal interviews with people who worked with Mr. Edison. In 1898, 
Edison, 51 years old, was perfecting a process to reduce low-grade iron ore on a scale never before attempted. He had built a new type of ore reduction plant in the Ogden Mountains of New Jersey, not far from his manufacturing plant in West Orange. The ore reduction plant was in production and ready to begin operating at full capacity. One afternoon, the plant manager, Walter S. Mallory, burst into Edison's private office in West Orange. Mr. Edison? Mr. Edison? Confounded, Mallory. You know I don't like to be interrupted. Yeah, but this is important. Well, what is it? About the ore reduction plant. Nothing's happened to it? No, it's, it's running all right, but... Have you much of your own money tied up in it? Nearly everything I've got. Well, I... I guess neither of us will get rich on it now. Why not? What's wrong? Well, I hate to tell you, but I can't put it off. Well, spit it out, man. What is it? News from the West. A huge deposit of high-grade iron ore has just been discovered. Where? In the Mesabi Range in Minnesota, lying right on the surface. Of course, it isn't as near the eastern smelters as our plant is. We can ship our product cheaper. Perhaps we can keep right on producing. No, we couldn't meet that price. We're through. What are we going to do? Shut down at once. But all our equipment, the giant rollers, the machinery... We'll have to find some other way of using them. Something that needs crushing and milling. Uh, something like, uh, uh, let me think. Uh, uh, yes, cement. But we don't know anything about cement. We will, Mallory. Get me every book you can find on it. I'll study the subject while you wind up the affairs of the ore reduction plant. I don't see why you're so cheerful, sir. Why shouldn't I be cheerful? I'm out of the manufacturing business and back to inventing again. But I thought you had much of your money tied up in the ore reduction plant. Why, it must have cost nearly $3 million. It did. A fortune. Yes, but Mallory. Yes? We had a lot of fun while it lasted. And there's still the cement business. Edison was never discouraged. Obstacles that would have appalled an ordinary man only stimulated him to greater effort. His study of the Portland cement business convinced him that the method then used in the industry was inefficient and wasteful. Too much of the heat used in burning the lime went up the chimney. Edison announced that he would use a kiln nearly twice as long as the one in general use. Impossible, cried all the experts. But he set up an experimental plant and put Mallory in charge of it. The first results were very disappointing. One hot summer day, Mallory calls at Edison's office. You wanted to see me, Mr. Edison? Yes, I did. Look here, Mallory. You know anything about alkalis as electric agents? I know. And what's that got to do with making Portland cement? Nothing. I'm trying to make a storage battery. With that junk you've got there? It isn't junk. It's experimental apparatus. <laughs> Looks like a lot of dirty tumblers to me. They're full of my new alkali solution. They're the last tumblers I've got in the place. This is the last of a long series of experiments in a hunt for an iron derivative. Wait till I connect these metal poles with an electric current. Uh, there. Well, nothing happened. Yes, I realize that, Mallory, but I've learned something. You've learned something? Yes. I've found 10,000 things that won't work. I've just discovered another one. <laughs> Look out! Oh! Oh, that's too bad, Mr. Edison. They all fell and broke. What do you do now? Well, I guess the next thing to do is to buy some more tumblers. Pardon me, sir, but did you ask me to come here from the cement plant on a scorching hot day just to show me this? No. I want you to see the report of the results you're getting in the cement plant. Well, I've seen it. I made out the report myself. It's not bad, is it? Not bad. It's rotten. Well, just because your kiln is two and a half times as long as the old kind, there's no reason to think you can get five times as much cement out of it. I expect five times as much. Your report shows only 500 barrels a day. 500 a day now? Uh, and that's a miracle. It's nothing. is isn't even a decent start. That long kill ought to be put out 1,000 barrels a day. Why, that's impossible. If that's your attitude, no wonder you don't get results. You're licked before you start. Now, look here, Mr. Edison. I've sweat and bled over that blasted kiln for weeks. And that's the best I can do. Well, it isn't good enough. And if you think there's 1,000 barrels of cement a day in that kiln, maybe you can get it out yourself. I can. Uh, we'll see about that. I'll answer it. I'll answer it. Hello? Yes? He's right here. To you, Mallory. Oh, thanks. Hello? Yes? What? Oh, she is. I, I see. Yes. Yes. Goodbye. What's the matter, Mallory? My little girl, Charlotte. She's worse. Well, what's wrong? Necrosis has set in, and the kneecaps you hurt. 
The doctor said this terrific heat is making it worse. The temperature in her room is 97. I'm afraid there's nothing we can do but pray heaven she lives through this heat wave. Uh, we, uh, we must end the heat wave. The weather reports say there'll be several days of it. Oh, hang the weather reports. We don't have to worry about the weather in the whole state of New Jersey. All we care about is the weather in your daughter's room. Well, I guess that's my worry, sir. You have troubles enough of your own. Now, uh, about that cement kiln, uh, if you really think... No, that never I... mind that, never mind that. There's another invention I've got to make right away. Well, then, if you don't mind, Mr. Edison, I'd like to go home. Of course, I, I'd, I'd like to go with you. You're very kind, Mr. Edison, but I don't want to take you from important work, sir. The important work I've got to do right now is something for your little girl. Well, I don't understand. Come over here to the drawing board. Hey there, Professor. Yes, Mr. Edison? Ought to be clean paper on my drawing board. Oh, I put some there an hour ago, sir. I can't imagine what's become of it. I can. It's become a cement plant. Oh, I'll get some clean paper right away, sir. Does it still amuse you to be your own draftsman, Mr. Edison? What's amusement got to do with it? It saves time. Instead of telling a man, I'd rather show him my idea on paper. Anyway, it gives my hands something to do while I'm thinking. I never waste time making finished drawings. I just make sketches. How do you find draftsmen who can translate them? I don't find them. They find me. Well, here's a paper, sir. Good. Now, file these sheets I've used under cement. Under cement? Oh, yes, cement. In the file, you mean. Right away, sir. Now, Mary... Let's take a quick look at what's in my mind. We've got to change the weather. In that room where your daughter Charlotte is. And let's see now. Yes. We ought to start like this. Well, I... Don't say anything. Don't say anything. Just watch. Edison completed his sketches on the drawing board. Then he sent Mallory to the carpenter shop with the drawings and with special orders that all other work should be dropped until the machine he had sketched was finished. An hour later, Mallory and one of the carpenters loaded a strange-looking wooden box on an automobile and started for Mallory's house. Outside Charlotte's hot, stuffy room, Mrs. Mallory meets her husband. Walter. Walter, won't you stop that noise? Charlotte is... She's... Oh, Walter. Why didn't you come right away when I telephoned you? Well, I, I couldn't, dear. You see, Mr. Edison... Mr. Edison. Mr. Edison. He's always wanting you to do something. Now, wait, dear. Mr. Edison has just made this for Charlotte and for us. That big wooden box. But, Walter, we can't have that in Charlotte's room. Oh, what's the use of it? She's thinking, Walter. The heat. I know, dear. But just let us bring it in and install it. Install it? What do you mean? Open the door to Charlotte's room, dear. I, I'll show you. If it works. If it works? Oh, Walter. Our little girl is worse. She, she's thinking and, and you want to experiment. Yes, dear, but I think it will help. Now, if you'll just trust in me and open the door. Very well. Please, Mrs. Mallory, the room must be quiet. But Mr. Mallory is here. It was an idea of Mr. Edison. I don't know what the doctor would say, I'm sure. Now, hold the door wide open, nurse, please. I, I think we can just get through with this box. Pardon me, Mr. Mallory. I don't think the doctor would like you to bring that thing into the room. It's all right, nurse. Now, stand aside while we carry the box over to the window, please. Walter, do you have to do this? Yes, dear, I do. I have a feeling that Mr. Edison has solved our problem. Oh, but, Walter, our problem is Charlotte. I realize that, my dear. Uh, put it down easy now, Simmons. Yes, sir. No noise, please. Yes, Mr. Ah, there. Yeah, that's got it. Now, help me fix those wooden legs for the box. Mr. Mallory, please. That big box just out the window sill there, it, it shuts off the air from the window, sir. What air there is. Yes, nurse. That's what it's meant to do. But, Mr. Mallory, that's the whole trouble. Try to let Charlotte have as much air as we can. Yes, nurse. Now, if you'll just stand back, please. You got that other leg fixed yet, Simon? Oh, wait, no. Uh, hold it. Hold it. Yes. Yes, there it is. The box is steady now, but I'll have to drive in a few nails to make sure the whole thing is firm. Oh, you can't do that. Not in this room. The doctor said Charlotte must be protected from noise. Oh, Walter, don't let him do it, please. My dear, you must let us go ahead with this thing. It, it may help Charlotte, and it's our only chance. Please, Mr. Mallory, we can't have any noise in the room. Simmons, go ahead with the nails. And don't make any more noise than's necessary. I won't, sir. Oh, Walter, why must you do this? I just told you, my dear. We're trying an experiment. Mr. Edison thinks it will work, and I do, too. There you are, sir. All right, Simmons. 
Now let's get that cake of ice. What are you mad? No, dear. Will you please just trust in me? Yes. Yes, of course I will. All right, then. Wait until I fix this thing in. How's that sound? Uh, is the box steady now? Well, it's as steady as I can make it, Mr. Mallory, without, without making too much noise. All right, then. Come and help me. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mrs. Mallory. Now, yes, don't be alarmed. I know my husband is trying this experiment for Charlotte's good. It's one of Mr. Edison's ideas, you know. Yes, Mrs. Mallory, I know. But I don't know what the doctor would say. Well, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Yes, I suppose so. But I won't be responsible. No, let it slip. Easy now, Simmons. Mm-hmm. All right, now. Up. Lift it up. Up into the box. Yes, sir. Yeah. Don't make any more noise than you can help when you put it down now. No, sir. Uh, look, look out for your fingers. All right. All right, now. Here we go. There. There. That's it. Now then, you wire up the electric pan while I close the other windows. Oh, Mr. Mallory, please, don't close the other window, sir. Your daughter needs all the air she can get. Yes, nurse, I know that. What I'm doing is for the best. There, now. Now this one. Mr. Mallory, pardon me, sir, but I must protest. I cannot allow you to leave those windows shut. Don't worry, nurse. It's all a part of our experiment. Now, I'm just going to close this window a bit. It's opposite the one that box is sitting in. I'm going to get open about uh, this much. There. Now, that's about right. Oh, Walter, you can't do this. You're shutting out all the air. Please, dear, now, just a moment. How about it, Simmons? The fan running? Uh, it will be, sir, when I turn it on. All right. Here we are. Wait now. Let's see what happens. I want to watch this thermometer. Walter, is that cool air I feel? Yes, I I think it is. But we'll have to wait and see. Well, Mr. Mallory, the room is cool. There's a draft of cold air blowing in from the window. I can feel it. And so can I. But I want to see if this thermometer will go down. Wait. Why, she's rousing. Charlotte is stirring. I never expected she would. But, Walter... I don't understand. See, dear, the fan draws the air into the room, and the ice cools it. It's just a makeshift device, but at least it will keep the room cooler than outside. And that ought to help Charlotte get well. Edison's crude air-cooling device helped bring Mallory's daughter out of danger. But it was another matter to get her well again. She did not rally. Her convalescence was discouragingly slow. When Edison heard this, he paid Charlotte a visit. In the hall outside of her room, Edison and Mallory meet the doctor. Well, doctor, how's your patient today, doctor? About the same, Mr. Edison. I must say the delay in her recovery is disheartening. Is there anything I can possibly do? No, Mr. Mallory, I'm afraid not. Don't you know of anything that would do her any good? Oh, yes. A change of scene would do wonders for her. Just the kind of a tonic she needs. She's too weak. I don't dare risk moving. Is there any medical tonic that will do the work? I'm giving her what I can, but it isn't entirely a matter of medicines. It's a matter of cooperation from her own tired little body. She needs normal acceleration of the glands and impulses. A natural quickening of the nervous system that would come from the stimulus she'd get from new surroundings. But you say can't be moved. Yes, that unfortunately is our dilemma. Well, there must be some way out. Well, if, if there is, Mr. Edison, I'm sure you could find it. Doctor, I've invented a slight improvement for my window box. You mind if I experiment with it? Go right ahead, Mr. Edison. I believe Charlotte can bear the noise now. I won't make any noise. My improvement is chemical, not physical, Doctor. We leave the physical improvement to Charlotte. Very well. Uh, will you excuse me? I have several other calls to make. Then I'll be back. Well, of course, Doctor. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye, Doctor. Well, Mr. Edison, Charlotte will be glad to see you. We could only get her happy and well again, Mallory. How's Mrs. Mallory bearing up? Well, she's resting. We'll find a nurse in charge. If you don't mind, I'll go in first. Right ahead. Is that you, Daddy? Yes, Lottie, and I brought your best bow with me. Is Mr. Edison here? Oh, I'm so glad. Hello, Charlotte. Doctor tells me you ought to take a trip somewhere. Make you strong and well again. Oh, I do wish so I could. But they won't let me. Well, how would you like to go on a trip with me? 
Just a little trip, sort of a picnic. Oh, I'd love to. Please don't excite her, Mr. Edison. Nurse, the doctor said she needed some natural stimulation. Yes, but not the depression that comes from disappointment. The nurse is right, Mr. Edison. Well, perhaps Charlotte won't be disappointed. Yes, but there's a risk. With more to gain than to lose. But if I haven't your permission, then of course I won't try my idea. Well, no, go ahead if you think it's all right. I have perfect confidence in you, sir. But, Mr. Mallory... I'll take the responsibility, nurse. Mr. Edison has an improvement on his window air box he wants to try. Let me help, Charlotte. Very well. But if I see any bad effects from it on the patient, you'll have to stop at once. Of course. When do you think I could go on a picnic with you, Mr. Edison? <laughs> Don't you think the best thing about a picnic is the fun of knowing you're outdoors under the trees with the cool air blowing over fields of fresh clover and flowers? Yes. Oh, oh, when can we go? Why, I think we can go right now. Now? Why, they won't let me leave this room. Not even this bed. We won't let that stop us from having fun. If we can't go out to the picnic, we'll bring the picnic in here. But it won't be the same. It'll be even better. You can have your choice for your picnic today. Where'll it be? Under some shade trees at the edge of a field with a brook? On a sandy beach down by the seashore? Or on the side of a mountain with a fine view and tall pine trees all around? Oh, the mountains. With the wind going through the pines and making a sort of music. All right, then. The mountains it is. Excuse me, Mallory. Let me that window box. Why, of course. Look, nurse. Look how our eyes are brightened. Her pulse is quickened, too. You must be careful. A serious reaction might hurt her. How can you bring the mountains in here, Mr. Edison? The trees I want are much too high for in here. Well, we'll see what we can do, Charlotte. Just pretend? Well, a little more than that. Try now. Can you close your eyes and imagine big, tall pine trees? Why, I can almost smell them. <laughs> That's funny. I could swear I smell them, too. Now we'll get the fire started to cook supper with. I smell something burning. Of course you do, nurse. That's the fine dry wood Charlotte and I have gathered for our picnic fire. Oh, you make it all seem so real. I can smell the smoke and the old dead leaves and pine trees. I know I can. It's just exactly like it. Are you any good with a frying pan, Mr. Edison? No, no. I always start experimenting with whatever's in it and spoil it. <laughs> oh, I can cook. You'd better let me do it. All right. Say, I smell the woods. Hmm, it's wonderful. Well, I'm a practical woman myself, but either I smell the woods too or else you're a spellbinder, Mr. Edison. Ought to be tried for witchcraft. <laughs> they used to call him the wizard of Menlo Park. There's no magic in this. It's just chemistry. Well, all chemistry's magic to me. Most of the smells in nature can be duplicated in a chemical laboratory. But this isn't a laboratory. I got several little bottles here. I brought them with me. Each has a picnic in it. Oh, goody. More picnics. Oh, I see, Mr. Edison. You just pour some fluid in front of the pan in the window box, and it fills the room with the same air you smell in the woods or the seashore or wherever you want to be. Exactly. Well, it's just like the real thing, except for the scenery. And the ants. <laughs> Mr. Edison, what shall I do with this lime juice I've got to taste? We'll squeeze it over that fine fresh trout after you've cooked it. Mm, that'll taste good. Yes, at least the limes are real. And so is the improvement in Charlotte. Your experiment has been a great success, Mr. Edison. You have a great mind, Mr. Edison. But it isn't half as great as his heart, nurse. It wasn't his genius that did this. It was his love. Aided by Mr. Edison's cooling contrivance and by his chemical picnics, Charlotte Mallory recovered from her illness. She grew up to be a fine young lady, one of the hundreds who knew Edison personally, who admired and respected and loved him. One of the greatest tributes to his memory is the Thomas Alva Edison Foundation, established to aid worthy students by those who knew and worked with him. The whole world has honored Edison for his inventive genius, this evening, we are proud to salute Thomas Alva Edison, the man, as DuPont adds his name to the cavalcade of America. Remember the old wheeze, everybody talks about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. Well, that's not true anymore. Modern chemistry has done a lot about weather. A chemist puts it this way. When you think of air conditioning, you think of cool comfort, regardless of outside temperatures. Chemistry contributes the ingredient that makes things cool. 
It's called a refrigerant, and DuPont produces a number of types, including several widely used for cooling and ice making. You know how these products of chemistry serve you in air-conditioned movies, stores, and restaurants, but industry has put them to work in unusual places. For example, far down in the Robinson Deep Gold Mine, South Africa, normal temperatures hover around 120 degrees, and the humidity makes this heat almost unbearable. But now the mine shaft has been air-conditioned, and the miners keep cool and comfortable 8,300 feet below the surface. The same is true in the magma copper mine at Superior, Arizona, where air-cooling plants are at work nearly three-quarters of a mile down. And on the Syrian desert, a new streamlined bus of glittering stainless steel made in Philadelphia by the Bud Manufacturing Company flashes 65 miles an hour along the sandy 600-mile run from Baghdad to Damascus as brown-skinned natives stare in astonishment. Its 14 passengers ride and sleep in comfort despite temperatures that may vary from zero to 140 degrees above. For this new Desert Express is air-conditioned. A DuPont refrigerant is used. And underwater, in submarines, DuPont refrigerants are at work in equipment that actually manufactures air for the men who work under the sea. Ocean liners now offer air-conditioned comfort for their passengers, too. While many steamers bringing fruit from the tropics protect their cargoes en route with air cooling that provides even coolness in all parts of the ship's hull. Now, how about air conditioning for you and me this summer? These chemical refrigerants keep you comfortable not only in movies, restaurants, stores, and hotels, but work for you almost everywhere. Today, all major trains in the United States are partly or completely air conditioned, with railroads installing equipment at the rate of 1,500 cars a year. Industries are using it increasingly where control of temperature and humidity is essential. Now, lower-cost room units are available for home and office, while air conditioning probably serves humanity best of all in the operating rooms of hospitals. Yes, it's certainly true that DuPont chemists, working with air conditioning engineers, help guard our health and comfort against summer high temperatures and humidity. This work is one more illustration of how DuPont is making good its pledge, better things for better living, through chemistry. Songs of the American Indian, the music and customs of primitive America will be the subject of our broadcast when next week at the same time, DuPont again presents The Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.